Okay, so we will uh, get started. We are very pleased to have uh, Rob Fergus from NYU. Um, he has been at all famous places, you know, masters from uh, Caltech and PhD from uh, uh, Oxford, and he's spent sabbatical, I mean, the postdoc at MIT. So he's now at NYU. Has done lots of interesting work um, in segmentation, object recognition, uh, several different areas. But lately, he has been uh, one of the leaders in uh, deep learning. So he's going to share some of his recent work in deep learning. Thanks, Marek. All right. So yes, I'm afraid I changed the talk title a little bit today, but um, I'm going to present a sort of bit of a, a few new pieces of work that my students have been uh, doing recently. So uh, the two students who've been mainly doing this are Matt and Lee, who are here. And so normally, of course, they're chained to their desk, coding away. But this is what they, you know, when they let off once in a while for this photo. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk uh, the, in about two sort of pieces of work, essentially. The first is really going to be a couple of tricks that help um, classic sort of old school convnets, uh, conv these convolutional neural networks, um, work really well, okay, on sort of, you know, image um, benchmarks that we, we use. And then I'll talk um, in the second uh, part of uh, the presentation about these things called deconvolutional networks. And so these are uh, things you probably haven't seen before. These are effectively unsupervised versions of neural nets, um, which um, are, you know, ultimately we'd like to be able to sort of use in conjunction with classical uh, convolutional networks. Um, and I'll discuss sort of, you know, the potential benefits of doing that. Okay, now, um, the reason there's been a bit of a resurgence in the last uh, little maybe year or so in just going back to these old school uh, convolutional neural networks, okay? So these are things, you know, from the sort of, you know, late 90s, Jan LeCun and people like that. Um, they used them in digits back in those days. And it turns out that, you know, one of Jeff Hinton's students, Alex Krzyzewski, he, he is just a fantastic engineer, and he really did a very, very careful implementation of these things on GPUs, trained up a huge model on the ImageNet uh, database, so, you know, several million training images. And, um, you know, this is a very big model with sort of, you know, you know, 60 million parameters, that kind of thing, trained for several weeks on, you know, these GPUs, which with a beautifully optimized implementation. And they got this, these fantastic results on the ImageNet challenge, okay? So the uh, current sort of, you know, vision techniques, you know, Pedro Felsenschwab's model with all the sort of bells and whistles attached, were getting in the order of about 26% error. And these guys got 16%, okay? So they were, you know, almost, uh, you know, a you know, huge jump in performance. And essentially, you know, it's just good engineering, a ton of labeled data, and a lot of patients just waiting around. And so these, um, this is certainly a big surprise to a lot of people. And so, you know, people have been looking at these, uh, net, you know, these classical models again to see perhaps, you know, what, they, what else we can do to improve things. So just to sort of, for those of you who aren't very familiar with a, a convolutional neural net, just to sort of, you know, give you a brief little um, viewpoint on these things. Um, hold on, where's my mouse cursor? Okay, so basically this is, you know, representation of just one layer of the model. Um, basically, you're going to take the input image, you're going to convolve that image with some learned filters, okay? And then you, they're going to pass those act the responses through some nonlinear activation function, something like a sigmoid, maybe some sort of rectified linear nonlinearity. And then you're going to do some kind of pooling, which will reduce the spatial resolution, and then you're going to get some feature maps, okay? And that's one layer of this model, and then you're going to re repeat this oper these operations, you know, several times to form a sort of hierarchy, um, as you can see here. And at some point, the sort of size of your feature maps will be small enough that you can go to sort of a fully connected neural net, which will then um, eventually output, you know, uh, a number of class labels. Okay, so in this little network, uh, just 10 because this was for the MNIST digits. But if you're dealing with ImageNet, where you have a thousand classes, you'd have a thousand output units. Okay, and this, this architecture is completely supervised. You're going to take um, an input image, you know, push it through this network, um, get some you know, output vector here, which should hopefully um, predict the correct class. And then the error with respect to the sort of true class is going to be then back propagated through the network to update uh, the filters in these convolutions. Okay, so um, you can think of this as a purely feed-forward network. You know, you put image in, get label prediction out. And um, the, you know, the idea's been around for a while. Um, but people have just sort of made it be work better recently. And um, 
the key, one of the key ingredients really is the fact that they've been training on these big image data sets. Okay? So in this case, it was one, about 1.2 million images. Another sort of key thing they were doing was to augment each training example by creating sort of flipped versions of, them, of it and doing different crops and so on. So really they're boosting up their the, you know, number of training images effectively to sort of 20 million or so, something in that ballpark. And this is absolutely crucial for getting any decent performance out of these models. But the sort of remarkable thing about this, these uh, giant nets, is that they still overfit. Okay? So it turns out that um, in these models, there's just a you know, huge number of parameters um, at these fully connected layers at the top. And there's also a large number of filters in the intermediary layers. Okay? So their network had sort of eight layers or so, not just you know, a, a two or three as shown in this figure. And so one of the um, key things, really, that uh, Hinton's uh, group did was to come up with a clever way of regularizing these networks. Okay? So that is, you, you have tons of parameters in the model. You want some way of sort of constraining what those parameters can do. Otherwise, they're just going to hopelessly memorize the training examples, even if you have 20 million of them. Okay? And it turns out it's better to sort of have a bigger model and regularize the heck out of it rather than to have a rather small model and sort of have underfitting going on. Okay? So that's the sort of motivation is that you want to have this giant model, regularize it somehow, uh, and, and it'll still hopefully do uh, good things on your test set. So, so they have yep. 100, 100 categories? Uh, in, the, in this particular image challenge, there are 1,000 categories, categories split across, um, you know, so basically 1,000 training images per category. Per category. Yeah, uh, you know, for 1,000. So they've got a lot of data, um, but there's, you know, 60 million parameters in the model. That's a lot of parameters, you, you know, to deal with. Okay, so one of their key things they came up with was this thing called dropout, which is a, a rather wacky idea on the face of it. Essentially, what they're going to do is to stochastically delete certain units. So for each different training example, um, at, you know, at a given layer, they're going to have an output vector um, of, resp of responses, and they just, with a certain probability, they're going to keep that response, or with, with one minus that probability, they're going to just remove it. Okay? And so in other words, instead of, you know, if you have a, a thousand twenty-four units, if P is uh, 0.5, then on average you'll have 512 units actually being non-zero uh, for each, you know, at each exemplar. And so just to see how this is actually applied, here's your little equation. So this, is, this, by the way, is applied to the fully connected layers of the network. I'll talk more about what happens in the convolutional cases later on. So you're going to take essentially your input vector, multiply it by your weights, and add your biases. So this is the standard neural net uh, architecture. Pass it through your nonlinear activation function. And then they're going to have this binary mask vector, okay, which is going to be either 0 or 1, and it's just going to simply you know, multiply, you know, do a MATLAB dot multiply by this, the output of this activation. Okay, and that's going to be the output for the layer. And they're going to draw this um, dropout mask vector randomly for each different um, in training example that they see. And it turns out that this um, actually, um, as we'll discuss in, in, in just a few slides, has quite a dramatic effect on the... Uh, it really helps the model generalize better. Okay? Effectively, what's going on is that you're um, preventing the units from sort of all collaborating together to predict the right answer. They, if, by doing this, you're forcing different groups of units to independently predict the right answer. Okay? And then you end up... Um, I'll, I'll show you some equations in a second, basically with a kind of model averaging idea. that You have you know, many different models, essentially, which independently are trying to predict the class label. So one very simple extension of this that we've just been playing with recently is something called drop, drop connect. So we submitted this to ICML. Essentially, what's going to go on here is instead of um, uh, randomly dropping the output units, you're going to drop connections within each layer. Okay? So instead now of having a, a, a sort of a stochastic binary vector that you apply uh, you know, the output of the activation, it's going to come in here directly on the weight. So you can think of now just you're sort of going to randomly delete weights in the network um, within each layer. Is that, yep. is that fixed? No. That? So for each training example, you're going to have a different binary matrix there. So you're going to delete different weights for each different training example. And each, and each time you, you go, because obviously you're going to do multiple epochs of training. So when you revisit that training example, you'll have a different random, um, different random matrix. And okay, so, random okay, so I'll talk about the test time in, in just a second. So this is all at training. So the idea is here, you're trying to sort of um, you know, stop the model going crazy and overfitting at training time. So this is just to show you a little picture to try and get this idea across more, more easily. What we're assuming is we've got some feature vector x that's come from, say, the convolutional layers of the network. So we're up at the top of the network here where things are fully connected. We're going to um, essentially... Uh, so where's my mouse pointer? Here we go. So here's our... Um, so this is the input, sorry, here, this thing here. You put, these are the other layers of the network beneath all condensed into one operation, which we're calling the feature extractor. 
you've got then this input to your fully connected layer V. You push through this, uh, the weight, the, weight, the dense weight matrix, which is effectively dot multiplied by some binary pattern like this. And then that produces a, a vector of um, activations, which you pass to the activation function. And that's your output. Okay, and if, it's, if you're just doing one layer of this, that would then go into a softmax, which would then predict, you know, your, this would be a C-length vector if you had C classes you were trying to predict. Okay, and this key point is that this binary matrix is being drawn kind of independently for each different train example in each epoch of training. And just to con contrast this with drop out, so in drop out, you're just um, effectively masking the output units, okay? So effectively, you've got a binary vector here, sort of black and green, which is like, you know, you're either keeping or leaving. And then, of course, from the pre previous layer, you're going to have another binary mask as well. So effectively, with drop out, this is the kind of binary mask you'd be applying to your weights, whereas in our case, we're doing it sort of completely randomly. Okay, and, th and this sort of randomness seems to really help uh, control the complexity of these models, okay? So, as I was saying uh, previously, it, it essentially forces the different groups of units in each layer to independently predict the output. And you can think about this as a kind of model averaging idea. So, you're familiar with things like, you know, um, you know, bagging and stuff like that. So, in this case, you can imagine your output is really going to be a sort of expectation over all the possible different masks that you would want to use, or all the possible binary patterns and each one of those is going to have a certain probability, P of M. And then effectively, that, those masks will effectively give you a different network F, um, which, you know, given an input, will produce a different output vector. And strictly speaking, if you want to do this um, you know, properly, you should sort of you know, sum up over all these different um, possible uh, mask variables you could use, you know, essentially integrating out over this mask. Uh, now, of course, um, I mean, and the key... Uh, one of the key issues is that, of course, there's a huge number of possible binary patterns. So in practice, you have sort of two to the m, where m is the number of um, possible masks that you could, um, or sorry, number of um, uh, weights in your mask, or number of elements in your mask, rather, uh, possible patterns. So there's a, this is a very large summation here. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that the thing does, seems to work, is that it effectively, you've got, you know, you're averaging over really an extraordinary, an exponentially large number of different binary patterns. Um, now, okay, of course, it, you'd like to be able to compute this um, sum exactly, but it's going to be imp intractable to actually do that evaluation over the exponential number. So, so this mask is different for yeah. different examples of the same category. Yes, for every different training example, you can have a different mask. So it requires actually some fairly careful implementation, actually, to be able to do this, because you, you have to rewrite the matrix vector multiplication in your GPU to um, effectively embed this binary mask that's going to be different for each so example. So I mean, you know, for the same category, yep. why would you want to have a different Because you, you, a different, um, you, you want to prevent the network from effectively uh, if, if you just had the same mask for each category, then you'd have effectively just a smaller network for that particular category. Whereas the idea is you want to actually really, um, you want the network to be able to share um, connections between different exemplars. And so if you, if you just use the same mask, you would effectively, you wouldn't have any sharing going on. You would just be con effectively locking the, uh, you know, all the exemplars of that um, class to use the same smaller network. So the key point is you want to have a big network, but just sort of stop it um, precisely, so it stop it sort of cons using all its, active, all its power to model a given exemplar. So uh, it, the truth is, I think the, the explanation is a bit hand wavy, and this is one of the things that we've you know, been tried to look at a little bit more, more theoretically. Um, so I'll, just before I do that, I just want to say one point. So at test time, what we're going to do is effectively compute some kind of expectation of this quantity, okay, which you can do, do through sampling. So you're not actually going to try out tons of different patterns and see what happens. You can effectively compute a test time um, as an approximation to this, uh, this summation here that you re you'd really like to compute. Okay, so just but as I was saying, to get some sort of handle on what exactly is going on in here, we, um, Lee managed to sort of derive some kind of complexity bound on uh, you know, a densely connected neural network layer, and he managed to work into that this idea of randomly deleting certain weights within the network, okay? So this rather daunting looking expression is just telling you that the complexity of your um, network is upper bounded by this 
term on the right-hand side, which is the complexity of your feature extractor, which is the convolutional layers of the network, and the various ex terms here, which depend on the size and number of units in your fully connected layer, and then this term P, which is effectively the probability of keeping the units. So effectively, if you have you know, P equals 1, then that's, you keep every weight with probability 1, so that's basically back to a standard neural net. If you have it probability 0, you're basically turning off the network entirely. There's no, nothing can get through. So then the complexity goes to zero. And if you have, so it's a sort of linear dependence on this, um, on the fraction of units that you decide to keep around. So you can see that effectively, it, it's directly controlling uh, this this um, complexity. This, in this case, we did the analysis using Radomacher complexity rather than like anything like VC dimension because Radomacher complexity is a bit easier to sort of direct, work the math through with. So in but, this, when you select this randomly, essentially means that you're selecting, you're not using all the pixels in the image? Uh, right, so this is only occurring at the very top of the network, so the feature extractors have, ex you know, which are looking directly at the pixels, those aren't being affected by this. It's only at the top of the network where you have the dense, the dense connect connections just before you feed into some softmax to actually make a prediction over the different classes. And so if you, mo if you look at the, the, these networks, often most of the parameters seem to be in these fully connected layers. And it's there that you're sort of controlling things. So you can't directly say you're not looking at certain pixels because obviously there's all this existing encoding going on in the, in the previous layers beneath, okay, which are actually doing quite sophisticated um, stuff. And almost certainly the features you're, that are input to this layer will depend on all the pixels, I should think. So yeah, there's, you've lost the notion of locality by this stage probably in, in the network. So do you train this with just stochastic gradient descent? Yes, ex exactly. It's trained stochastic gradient descent. And so you're going to take you know, basically a batch of... Um, images onto your GPU. For each of those images in that batch, you're going to have a different random pa pattern for your, 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 your dropout mask. And then you're going to do this, um, yeah, effectively push each example through the fully connected layer using that, uh, the particular binary mask of that example. And then when you do the back prop, you respect which elements were effectively set to, z which weights were set to zero when you push the gradients back through. Okay, so you have to sort of keep track of that so, so as you come back. Yeah, okay, so, so we're now talking about the optimization. So, okay, so just to talk about that. So, first of all, Jan's paper is actually more about using a diagonal approximation to the Hessian rather than trying to do a low rank approximation. People have tried LBFGS with these things, but they, they're rather disappointing in their performance. And that, you know, ultimately, boring old SGD seems to actually do pretty well. And so, um, but it's, it, this is an interesting question to revisit now in the context of sort of parallelizing these things over many, many GPUs and many cores, uh, because then the answer's a little bit more complicated. Um, okay, so of course, you know, we're doing neural nets, so we have to show some results on MNIST. Uh, so this is a little uh, example here where we're just um, comparing different types of nonlinearity in the model. So ReLU is a nonlinear activation. Uh, there's no marker. Hold on. Do we have a, is there a pen anywhere? Don't seem to find one. Well, okay. Well, anyway, uh, the, non, the first nonlinearity, this ReLU thing, it looks like this. Okay. So if it's negative, it's uh, zero. If it's positive, it's linear. Um, the sigmoid is um, a funny sort of you know curvy shape like that, and tan h is the same, but just there's a different uh, kind of offset. Okay. So in this case here, what we're doing is just showing you uh, the we trained five different networks. This is a, a very s sort of fairly simple architecture. Um, you're training five different models. And this is the mean and variance of their performance. And this is the th you know, three different techniques here. No drop is where you don't do any kind of deletion of, of weights or units in the network. Uh, drop out is, is the Hinton's thing, and drop connect is our thing. Okay? So, and then this is the voting errors. This is when you take all five models, and you essentially average their predictions for each class. Okay? And so you do get a gain when you do that. Um, and you'll see that, in practice, uh, this, this, non this uh, rectified linear seems to work better. And we get um, quite low numbers here for this. So this is just a, to compare the you know, drop out and drop connect. If you use a bigger network, um, you can actually, this um, is, if you do sort of data augmentation with crops and rotations and scalings, this is actually the lowest um, uh, error, error ever recorded on MNIST, which I know MNIST is a bit of a trivial data set, but still, it's sort of been worked over so much that it's fairly impressive you can get down to these, these numbers. But just to understand a little bit what these things are doing, uh, so here you can see as you increase the number of hidden units, so this, is a two layer, this is a network with two hidden layers, we're, we're changing the number of units in those hidden layers, so we're increasing the complexity of the model, and if you don't have any kind of, the, of this sort of you know, uh, drop out or drop connect 
going on, you can see the model starts to overfit. All right? So the test error starts going up, which is not what you want, of course. If you use the dropout, you can see that this, this test error starts to decrease as you increase the model complexity, and the drop connect sort of does an even better job of controlling things and gets lower error. Okay? So th both these are sort of effective strategies here for controlling the complexities of these networks. The other thing you can try is, of course, you know, do you want to keep the, the standard default parameter is to keep the weights half the time and half the time remove them. So, if, you know, so this would be, um, you know, essentially at 50%, this, this point here. You could try varying that parameter and just seeing how much of a difference it makes. So this is test error here with, you know, a network with two hidden layers with 400, 400 units in each. And um, you can see that, you know, the things aren't too sensitive as long as you're around this sort of 0.4 to 0.6 region things seem to um, work fairly reliably, okay? You can get, um, uh, you know, you can definitely get lower, uh, get better performance. So if it's up at one, if you keep all the elements, that's as if you weren't doing any of this uh, sort of stochastic deletion in the network at all. And then just to perhaps to give you a more vivid idea of what's going on, as you train the network, just to show you that this thing really is kind of slowing things down uh, and stopping overfitting. So what we're looking at here is training a network on MNIST um, these three curves here, one, two, three, those are, that's a, your training error. Now, of course, if you don't have any of this, business, any of this drop out or drop connect, it, the model very, very quickly goes to zero. Um, in this case, it's not training error, it's cross entropy, which is the, another, you know, the, more, the continuous measure that you're going to use at the, at the output. But basically, your training error kind of goes to zero super quickly. All right, so you overfit like... like nobody's business and your test error of course does, stops going down at that you know once you over, start overfitting on the training set okay now if you do the the drop out you can get you on this red curve so now the convergence is much slower okay so now it's you know even after a thousand epochs it's still the training error is still going down and you can see the test error now goes down below the uh the the, the error you would have had without the dropout okay and then drop connect is sort of an even more extreme version where you're even slower but then the test error you know, is going down, still going down a little bit, even after 1,000 epochs. Right? Okay, so you're really sort of stopping that network, going crazy, and overfitting things. Um, so on a slightly more challenging data set, on CIFAR 10, so these are like you know, 32 by 32 color images, 10 different classes, 10,000 training samples per class. Um, you, we can actually get the state-of-the-art um, performance on this thing. So the previous state-of-the-art was 11.2. And if you use the drop connect with, with um, in this case, voting over 12 different models, so you've you know, rerun the, mo the whole system with different random initialization, you get, you know, a slightly different result at the end for each model, and you just average their outputs, we can get down to sort of 9.3% on this. So this is actually a fair jump over the previous state of the art. And, um, it, and it does work better than you know, this, this idea of, of randomly, you know, deleting the weights rather than the outputs. Um, you know, that is, you know, using drop connect rather than drop out seems to make a difference. Uh, you know, although admittedly a small one. We seem, for whatever reason, we do seem to get quite a big, the gain is more pronounced when we do the model averaging, uh, which, so maybe the, you know, this random deletion also helps the networks learn sort of slightly different solutions. Okay, now, um, one uh, problem with all this, of course, is that the, this only really applies to the fully connected layers at the top of the network. And what do you do for those convolutional layers in between? Okay, and that's obviously, you know, vital for images. We want to be able to learn lots of these, you know, many of these convolutional um, layers in the network. Um, and the other catch, actually, I, as I briefly mentioned, is you do actually need to implement this drop connect idea very carefully on the GPU. It's, it's non-trivial to get this thing to, to be fast enough to be able to train these big models. So the second little sort of trick that we've been working on is something called stochastic pooling. Okay, and this is a, a way of regularizing those convolutional layers in the network. So this is something, you know, in, you know orthogonal to the drop out or drop connect. You can combine the two ideas. Now, and and it's, it's super simple, so I can explain it basically in pretty much one slide. All you're going to do is instead of doing a max or sum in your local pooling region, so you know, and that's what happens in most standard neural nets, you either do max or sum, you're going to do a stochastic selection of an, the element. Okay, so just to show a little example, so here's a piece of input image. You've got two edges, one bright, one dark. Um, there's your little filter, your convolution filter. You're going to convolve this with the image and pass through nonlinearity. So this is your sort of your activations here. So you can see you get sort of zeros and there's two peaks, one which is a bit bigger than the other because this was a bit darker uh, you know, than this one. And in max pooling, you would just pick the, the strongest one, this guy here. In some pooling, you would sort of take an average of these guys um, 
Well, I suppose if it's a sum, you just add the two things up rather than you know, dividing through by nine or whatever. But um, in stochastic pooling, what you're going to do is to treat this is like a probability map, so you're going to sort of divide here through by the total. So there's your probability map. And you're just going to you know, stochastically sample an activation from this map. So, if, for example, you draw you know, the number and it comes up with one. So you know, that will get, pick the first, the top left element. Okay? And that's the activation that you would pass on. So then when you at a different, um, for the next training, and you're going to do this you know, sampling for each different pooling region, for each different input image at training time separately. Okay? So again, it's the same idea of sort of injecting kind of randomness into the network during training. And this turns out to also really help you prevent overfitting. So this is a CIFAR 10, some numbers here. So what we're doing here is we're varying what we're doing at training time. So that's the stochastic pooling I've just described. You could do things like max pooling or average pooling, which are the sort of more conventional approaches. And you'll see that the, with these ones, you, your training error is in max pooling is basically zero, so you've overfitted. Um, with average pooling, it, doesn't, it, it gets pretty low, not, it doesn't quite go to zero. When you do the stochastic pooling, it, the training error never, never gets down completely to zero. But then the test errors look a lot better. So you can see here the test errors are pretty nasty um, in, these, in this case, um, depending on exactly what you're doing uh, at test time. Uh, but then if you do the uh, um, if you, at test time, if basically if you either do some sort of continuous version where you just take the expectation over each region, or you just simply um, uh, average over multiple different draws. So you could, you could always just, at test time, take the same input example and just you know, run your, you know, randomly draw different um, you know, pooling locations for each one using the probability distribution you get from the activations. Um, and you get basically uh, you know, much better numbers. So, this is, uh, so the key point is at training time, you want to have the randomness. At test time, you don't want to be random. You basically just want to sort of take the expectation um, and use that, which is the top row. Effectively, sure. Is there such thing as worst case input for this training? Uh, worst case input. Um, well, I mean, I, the truth is, all these all these models are definitely, you know, they're deforming some very, um, you know, big energy surface in some high dimensional space, and they def they can only really deform that around the training example. So, if you give it examples that it's never seen before then you know, all bets are off in terms of what's going to happen, in terms of the network could do something really crazy, because these things aren't really, they're not really regularizing globally the energy surface. They're doing more sort of local regularization of things. So, um, so I think, yeah, the answer would be if you just pick something that's never seen before, it could do anything, uh, I think so. Um, uh, right, so then you can do things like you can vary the size of the training set. So if you starve it of, tra of labels in your training examples, then you start to see um, you know, that uh, this stochastic pooling sort of generally fares better. Of course, all the training error goes up as you, uh, you know, give it fewer labeled examples, but uh, you know, it's overfitting kind of less badly with this idea of stochastic pooling. Um, and then, yeah, again, this is another plot showing sort of what happens at train and test time. So you can see uh, the, you know, your max pooling uh, oh, completely overfits at training time, and the test error stops going down. But with the stochastic pooling, um, you know, you keep improving slowly the, your training performance and your test performance keeps going down as well. Okay, so this, this, this is what you care about, this, the solid curve here compared to these two curves, which is the sum, oh, sorry, the max or the average pooling. So, so what is the I mean, intuition that why would the stuff... Well, one, one intuition is that when you take, for example, the max, you're throwing away quite a lot of information, right? So in those pooling regions, there may be multiple strong responses. Mm -hmm. And if you do max, you're just ignoring completely one of them. Okay, you're just picking the strongest one. So the stochastic at least allows the network to look at different, uh, it, it gives that weaker response to at least you know, have some influence yeah, further on in the network. So that's, that's, that seems like a good idea. Um, and it's, but there's a chance that it will completely select the wrong one. Well, of course, it is done stochastically, right? So if you revisit that same training example, if you, just, if you locked the weights, so you didn't, up, of course, you're updating the weights as you train the whole time, but if you just lock the weights, um, you know, if, if, if the activation was very weak, you know, some sort of noise-like thing, then it's going to get selected very rarely compared to the strong activations. But if you had two sort of, comp you know, ones of equal strength, then yes, it's going to be kind of like 50-50 chance of picking each, each one. So I think that's, that's one possible interpretation. But I think it's also, um, 
in some sense, it's also the fact you're sort of introducing noise here into the training signal. So that's going to, it prevents the model. If it tries to sort of fit the noise, it's not going to get anywhere, right? So um, it, it, you hope it's, you know, it's a way of sort of stopping the model completely memorizing the training examples. Yeah. So uh, when you're doing stochastic pooling, are you selecting randomly a single element from the activation layer? Or yes. Or generating a matrix? No, 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 you're picking a, si in this, in this one, you're picking a single element. So in this case here, you, would, you pick just that guy, and then he's the one who gets passed. Well, I mean, because you pass on the actual activation, not the normalized probability map. OK. Can you do like a, a random matrix of the size of the activation there, and just basically do a weighted mean? Where so that's what we do at test time. That's what's happening at test time. Okay. So at test time, you, you, you would take these would be activations, you would compute these probabilities, and you would do a sort of weighting. So you would you know, basically take this thing times that, and, and sum. So that's what happens at test. Yeah. So I didn't explain that very well. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I guess, some, uh, well, okay, I'll just start moving a bit faster. So yeah, the, uh, so this is just some numbers on CIFAR 10 and 100, so it seems to work pretty well there. On Google House, Street View House numbers, so this is a big um, sort of MNIST-like data set, but a little bit more realistic. So these are examples um, from, uh, you know, Google Street View. You know, they want to recognize house numbers so they can label houses on, on, on the, when you look things up at Street View. And they have tons of labels, right? So this is, you know, ideal for these purely supervised methods. And we do actually beat the, um, the current uh, state of the art fairly convincingly using these kinds of things, okay? So it turns out that actually with the careful training, you can, you know, even max and sum pooling do pretty well, but you can definitely get a gain doing the stochastic pooling. Okay, now look, now these two things, this idea of stochastic pooling and this drop connect, they're both tricks for sort of improving standard vanilla neural nets, right? Now, you know, I think, you know, this is good for getting impressive numbers, and I was hoping to have some numbers to show you on ImageNet, because we do actually have giant models running on ImageNet, and unfortunately my student went on spring break, so he hasn't been able to give me the numbers, but we, we are marginally better than Alex's results, uh, which, so, yeah, we, we're slightly ahead of the state of the art with, with these things, but uh, they're not sort of far enough ahead for me to make it worth uh, talking about, I guess, at this point. Although, fingers crossed, they will be a fair a bit, bit ahead once you... Once you once, break, right? Sorry? Yeah, well... Yeah, I tried that, but it wasn't very popular, so... Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is uh, essentially a, a, a different way of thinking about uh, neural nets, and I think you could view these things I'm about to describe as a mechanism for regularizing the standard models that I've been talking about, okay? And what I'm going to describe, uh, essentially, is... Um, oops, sorry, this is slightly out of order. Well, here we go. Okay, so just to um, flash back, this is what a, st a single layer of a standard neural net looks like. Okay, it's all everything's going from input upwards to feature maps. Okay, in these de deconvolutional networks, everything is uh, is topsy turvy. Everything's going to be the other way around. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to start off. It's a little generative model now. You're going to. Oh, I'm going to use the pointer so everyone can see. Um, so you're going to start off with some feature maps. You're going to do some unpooling, which seems kind of surreal. How can you unpool? Well, that's going to involve some latent variables, which I'll describe in just a second. And then you're going to sort of convolve those unpooled feature maps, um, and which will then reconstruct the input image. Okay, now, of course, when we do this, this whole thing is going to be actually overcomplete. So we're going to need some kind of constraint on these feature maps, and we're going to use something like sparsity to you know, prevent it from kind of completely uh, degenerating. And, uh, Effectively, so this is completely unsupervised. There's no labels here at all. All you're trying to do is to reconstruct your input image using some kind of sparsity constraint. That's, that's the sort of name of the game here. So that you can think about this as a sort of top-down model as opposed to a sort of you know, bottom-up model, which the standard convolutional networks are doing. And so I've been working on these models a little bit with, with Matt. So we have some papers at CVPR and ICCV on this uh, kind of thing. Okay, so just, and then this is one layer of, of the model, and of course, as the name suggests, we're going to try and stack things. So this is what then will happen. We'll have, you know, all those components will basically be, you know, collapsed down to one layer, and then we're going to, you know, there's, this is one layer reconstructing the input image, but then we're going to sort of, you know, try and use layers above to reconstruct uh, through these feature maps uh, down to the input as well. Okay, I'm going to build up like this. And, you know, one, the models we've been working on uh, so far, we've just tried to do things purely using this kind of uh, generative approach. So we're going to try and you know, learn models that look a little bit like this. And then if we, for classification, we can just sort of take these features and train a standard classifier on top if we want. Okay, but, but the construction of the hierarchy um, is, does not involve labels you know, as, as such directly. So this is sort of how we would then 
uh, if we did want to use it for classification, we just stick something on top. And, um, and sort of where we're, we're sort of trying to head with this, and this is like we haven't got there yet, but we, where we'd like to go is to sort of, of course, combine these two models, okay? So we've got many of the same components as, well, basically it's, it's the same components as a convnet, but just everything's sort of operating backwards. And what we'd like to do is to effectively, you know, tie the, you know, get these two pathways, the sort of feed-forward pathway and our little sort of feedback pathway talking to one another, okay? And so the, and there's two, this, the most simple way we could kind of get these things to interact would be to train up unsupervised um, the, the deconvnet um, hierarchy and use those parameters as a kind of initialization for the feed-forward model, okay? And that is the convnet, okay? So that would be one way to kind of, you know, start the, um, you know, stochastic gradient descent um, in the standard convnet at a sensible location. We could already use features we discovered in an unsupervised fashion. So this is the sort of notion of pre-training that Hinton was doing, has been doing with his, you know, RBMs and stuff like that. I think, of, I, but then a, a second sort of more exciting thing, which we really, I really want to try and do, is to actually get these, these layers to interact with one another. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, this, these layers would have kind of springs, if you like, between them, which would, so this, when you're f feeding the features forward, you know, certain features might be inhibited or excited by whatever was going on in this layer here, okay? And then when you train, the, you'd like to train this thing completely jointly so that you're trying to optimize both reconstruction error and some kind of classification error up at the top here um, as well. So sort of joint, um, a joint thing, okay? So actually, uh, so Yang Yang, one of uh, Mubarak's students, showed me something, some similar kind of um, model. Well, she was using really a generative model that was you know, used both reconstruction and labels uh, as well. Um, but this is a slightly more ambitious thing where we would try to, try to have um, these uh, features kind of interacting with one another and train the whole thing sort of simultaneously with, you know, all these layers at the same time. Okay, so we haven't got there yet. This is what we'd like to do. What I'm going to spend the remaining time doing is describing briefly this part of the model. Okay, so, we, you know, obviously this one is pretty familiar. Uh, you're pretty familiar with. But this one is uh, probably it's a bit more mysterious how this thing would actually work. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to do a quick recap, um, well, hold on, before I get to this, basically this, this, this is going to be a sort of hierarchical form of sparse coding. So before I describe that, how it works, let's just take standard vanilla sparse coding, and we're going to be dealing with image patches. So hopefully most of you have seen something like this before. You take an image patch, and you, the idea is you're going to try and represent it as a linear combination of dictionary elements. So here's your dictionary, and at inference time, you, you know, you know your dictionary, you're given some little image patch Y, and your objective is to find the sparse vector P, um, which is, you know, mainly zeros, and the few non-zeros are going to correspond to the weights across these elements. And, the, and that's going to reconstruct your image patch for you um, under some constraint on the number of sort of non-zero elements in, in P. Okay. Uh, now, the, the, this is all good and well, but we're dealing with, we want to do with whole images, not just little image patches. So what we're going to do is to sort of change the topology of this. So this is showing you one layer of the deconvnet. So let's just start off by looking at the convolution part of it, not the, un, not the pooling part up here. And what you have now, instead of a sparse feature vector, they're going to be feature maps, okay? And each map is going to be convolved with a dictionary element. This is what they, so we have multiple planes to the dictionary element because we have multiple color channels at the, in, in the input image. And it's overcomplete, just as you're overcomplete in standard sparse coding because you have multiple feature maps now. And what's, and you're gonna, instead of you know, doing a sort of matrix vector multiplication, you're gonna be in a convolution of the uh, map with the uh, dictionary element, okay? And then you're gonna sum up the total and then that's gonna produce, hopefully reconstruct your input image. Um, and you still have to stop the whole thing. This is overcomplete, as I said, so you want to have some kind of sparsity constraint here on each of these feature maps, which is going to be, you know, essentially, um, you know, it's going to be applied per element just to sort of, you know, constrain the L1 norm or something like that. Uh, in, the, in practice, we actually use a sort of norm less than one. It seems to work a little bit better. Um, so, you know, given an input image, you actually need to solve a sparse coding problem to compute the features in these unpooled maps, okay? So that's... Um, you know, in complete contrast to the uh, standard feed-forward convnets where you, you, apply, you directly apply your filters to the input image. In this case, the filters are being applied to the feature maps, right? Not to the image itself. And so, you know, it's the, the, you apply it to this and you're trying to reconstruct the input. Okay, now the second uh, sort of component in each layer is the pooling operation. So that's going to take these and sort of, uh, you know, make a smaller resolution feature map. 
but because we're thinking about things as a generative model here, we want to be able to sort of, you know, come the other direction. So given a feature, a little pooled map up the top, we want to be able to sort of, you know, reconstruct this unpooled map. And basically to do that, we need to have some sort of latent variables involved in this uh, scheme, okay? And the simplest way to describe this is thinking about max pooling. So here's your little feature map. You've got some activations that you've done your, your convolutional version of sparse coding with. You've got your little pooling neighborhoods like so. And what you're going to do is to just, if you pool them, we're going to sort of both record the, the max locations in each region, but also going to keep track of where they came from. And if you keep these guys around, we're going to call them switches. These switches can be used to basically reconstruct a kind of an approximate version of that feature map. So in other words, you can sort of go backwards now through that pooling step. Okay. And so we can write down now just a simple expression for um, a single layer of the model where you've effectively got some uh, feature maps P, the pooled feature maps, and then you're going to unpool them with switches uh, theta. Hold on. Back up here a second. Sorry. Before I get into this. So this term is the reconstruction. You're trying to reconstruct your input. Here is a sparsity constraint on your feature maps P. Um, there's your input image, um, your feature maps in both t terms. You've then got yeah, two operations, basically, to get from the feature maps back down to the image. You've got this unpooling operation where you take your feature map, each feature map K, PK, and you unpool it using uh, certain pooling variables to get the unpooled map ZK, and then you convolve that with your filters and to get back your reconstruction. Okay? So, uh, and then you have a sort of hyperparameter lambda which controls the balance between your reconstruction and sparsity. So just to illustrate which is a latent variable and which is a parameter. So um, effectively, the, the parameters of your model are going to be the filters, which that's your dictionary elements in sparse coding, which are learned, which are shared across all the images. And then your latent variables are going to be your, the feature maps and the pooling variables, the, the, the things which tell you effectively how you, get, how you unpool back down to the input. And basically, we can, what we're going to do is to sort of, uh, you know, on a big on a training time, we have to figure out both the red and the green terms. And at test time, you know, we know the learned filters, so we can just need, just need to run inference to figure out the red terms in this uh, slide. So in this one, what's the reason that you want to do this sparse and dictionary? So I, you want the um, well. So people have found that sparse coding seems to be a fairly effective way of sort of decomposing. Um, image structures. So the idea is you, you're going to have a series of sort of little building blocks in which you can use to reconstruct the input. Um, so and it's, it's a fairly simple uh, model in the sense that this is basically a sort of, you know, a simple L2 term that's very easy to optimize. And then the sparsity is really uh, effectively supp suppressing. Okay, so I've got a slide coming up actually that's going to, yeah, that perhaps make this point more clearly. Okay, so at, at inference time, you basically got two things you need to infer. The feature maps, okay, and then um, the pooling variables. And what, I'm, what I'd like to try and emphasize is that what you're already doing here is you're doing a sort of decomposition into what and where. So this is, in neural nets, you don't, everything's just homogeneous sort of, you know, gunk as it were. And in this model, you're going to have an explicit separation into sort of, you know, what information in the feature maps and the where information, which it tells you, you know, exactly the precise location that those things appear in. And that's going to be held in these pooling variables, the switches. And essentially, if we can infer both of these, holding the other ones fixed. So you fix the pooling variables. You can run a standard sparse coding algorithm, something called ISTA, to infer the feature maps. And then you, you, know, you can fix your feature maps and update your pooling variables. And just to give you a little toy example, so here's a little MNIST digit. Um, these are your feature maps. You unpool to get these things. And then you convolve each of these with, with your filters. And then that produces a reconstruction, which is close to the input image. All right? Um, now, what does the sparsity do? Now, this is where it's a little non-obvious. Essentially, if we take a little patch of our reconstruction, okay, so say this little guy down here in the green window, okay, now that corresponds up here to these little elements in these feature maps, all right. And what the sparsity is doing is effectively inducing a kind of competition between the elements to give the cheapest explanation of the, of the input pixels in this little green neighborhood. So this is effectively, if you're a machine learning person, this is what you might call explaining away, so if you're a graphical model person or whatever. And this is something you don't have in a feed-forward model. In a feed-forward model, you would just take a filter and you would convert you know, all your filters and you would convolve it with this, this, this patch of the input, and you get a whole series of responses lighting up in the feature maps. When, you're doing, when you have the sparsity constraint, it's effectively going to suppress all the small stuff and only let some of the really strong activations take, you know, um, come on. And so, uh, 
whoops, sorry. And so this, as I say, this is a kind of crucial difference with the sort of top-down model versus a bottom-up model. You, this is the sort of behavior you cannot get um, with just you know, a standard convolutional network. And just to understand what these pooling variables do, as I said, they're effectively coding what? And so they can encode local perturbations of your input patches. So what we're looking at here are sort of different patches of input image, which all you know, cause the particular feature map that is associated with this filter to respond strongly. So you can see this is the prototype here, but you can see lots of little sort of perturbations of it um, you know, in different, um, you know, sorry, this filter effectively um, responds to lots of different input patterns up here because of the pooling variables. Those pooling variables are sort of jiggling around, allowing little do local deformations to take place, which is, of course, what you need if you want to give it, get a good reconstruction. Okay, so now I'll just kind of going to have to skip over, unfortunately, the details of the multi-layer training because it's a little bit complicated. But basically, we do this, we're able to do sort of joint inference where we can infer all, do further feature maps at all layers simultaneously in the model, um, unlike many of these models that kind of go greedy layer-wise. So let me just skip over. So this is kind of what a two-layer thing would look like. Just now you see only a few elements are on. When you unpool down to your second layer, you get some sort of structures appearing. And you can see here, you know, different parts of the digit are coming from different colored uh, feature maps here. It's just, just a visualization to show, you know, which feature here is responsible for which part of the input. Um, I'll just skip over this because it's a bit long. And so now you can see, because we've got two layers of switches, now you see greater sort of variability in the structures um, that each feature map accounts for. Okay, so you can see different sort of little curvature pieces, different, you know, different types. Some of them are sort of open and closed loops and stuff like that, and so on. So this is a way, in some sense, now of all the sort of local uh, perturbations are distilled off into these switch variables, and the what signal carries stuff that we we like to keep around for, um, you know, classification. So this kind of notion of what where separation in neural nets is something that other people are exploring. So this is something called, Hinton's got a model called transforming autoencoders. Um, Jan and one of his postdocs has had something somewhat similar. Um, and it actually has a lot of links to sort of standard vision models that most of you are probably familiar with. So these parts and structure models are very similar. So you can think of in our model, a part is basically a filter in our model. And then the uh, structure, that is the relative positions of these parts, is effectively recorded in the pooling variables. And um, what you, the springs in these kinds of parts and structure models will correspond to priors on our switches, which we don't have in the model at present, but we're working on sort of putting in. Okay, I'm just going to skip over this for, that for, for time. So I'll just show you some, some results on Caltech. So this is just running on Caltech 101, um, training completely unsupervised. I'll just skip over this slide, actually. So this is, this is the kind of filters you learn in the first layer. So of course, you just get Gabor's, like everything else. Because it's convolutional, you don't need to have replicated versions of the same orientation at different offsets. That goes away with the convolutional architecture. At the second layer, you start to get interesting compositions of these uh, Gabor's. So you start getting sort of T-junctions and things like parallel lines. And if you sort of visualize you know, different, the Im bits of input image, which um, you know, are all grouped together in the feature maps, then um, you start to see sort of the lo lots of this nice little local variation. So sometimes you see a T-junction, sometimes you see a corner, depending on the exact position of the two Gabor's beneath. Okay? And this is the reason these are grouped together is because the switch variables in the model can sort of mo shift the little pieces around. Um, and then if you go up to the third layer, now we're starting to assemble sort of you know, little pieces of object. So you can see grouped into each of the feature maps, you start seeing these different you know, things, like you know, sometimes it's a and a sort of, you know, some sort of curved ob thing like that or some other structure like this. And so you're, you're seeing greater variability as you move up because there's more sort of flexibility in the, in the switch variables as you go down, back down to the input. And at the top of the model, so this is a four-layer model, we'd like to, of course, magically discover all the different Caltech 101 classes in each feature map. That doesn't quite happen exactly. Sometimes we get, it works okay with, like, these octopi. But with, you know, sometimes you get the pianos appearing in the same feature map, but the model doesn't seem to quite work as well as we'd hope. You know, sometimes you get like stop signs appearing with, along with you know, little insects or something like that. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, you know, essentially an unsupervised way here to sort of build these sort of compositional features. And we can try throwing these features in to standard classifiers in place of things like SIFT. So when we do that, the first layer features get sort of you know, high 60s, um, SIFT by itself gets about 65. So we're using the same classifier here. We're just changing the features that we're using. So if we try 
um, using the, the higher level features, when we sort of combine them with the lower level ones, we do get some performance gain, but it's not quite as dramatic as we'd hope. So it's, uh, unfortunately, the mo these numbers are a bit old. The sort of current state of the art now has moved on quite a bit. So we, uh, we're sort of, um, I mean, the slightly disappointing thing here is that because we're training the features generatively, they don't seem to be that discriminative. In you know, um, so some sort of hybrid approach where you would train both generative and discriminatively might really help in this kind of model. It's using uh, Svetlana Lezebnik's spatial pyramid matching. So that's the you know, that's spatial pyramid pooling, and then you throw this big long feature vector into an SVM with uh, the histogram intersection kernel. Um, but just to make the point that we're using the same features, the classifier is the same, and just all you're doing is swapping out the features that you're doing the spatial pyramid on. Um, if you do Caltech uh, 256, this slightly more, you know, less worked over data set, um, you know, we do see some gain over SIFT. I mean, again, not, not super dramatic. So, so the, I mean, the Hinton, you said they got a pretty good results of Dimension 8. Yeah. Um, so what's the link there? Well, the, the link, so, okay, so I guess I should just go to my, my last slide. So basically their model is purely um, feed forward, and, okay? And that's how they're getting fantastic numbers, is just having enough training examples to train the heck out of this kind of model. The truth is that they're, they're, they're still struggling to avoid overfitting and that they would like to go to bigger models, but they just don't have enough data. And, you know, all these tricks with dropout and all this sort of stuff, they help you, but they're not the substitute for really having, you know, something like this pathway in there. And that's really what we'd like to do is to have the deconvnet uh, model kind of controlling the complexity of this guy. And that would hopefully be, let you really scale up to sort of these super giant models. I mean, so, I mean, the standard, um, these, these models work really great if you have thousands of training examples. But what do you do if you've got, you know, a, a really rare class, right, like a hedgehog or something? I mean, it's probably hard to find more than a few hundred or a few thousand training examples of a hedgehog. And, you know, as, as most of you are aware, there's a sort of power law distribution of class frequency, right? So that things like people and cars and faces, no problem, we can get, you know, billions of examples. But there's a ton of very rare objects that we're able to learn really easily, but you just can't do, uh, you know, you, I mean, there's no way you could train uh, purely supervised for those kinds of things, okay? And so you probably want something that can uh, train unsupervised on that sort of stuff. And um, that's really where hopefully where the deconvnets will come in. So the hope will be that those kind of features that we've discovered with the convnet, you could either use those again to sort of directly uh, initialize this, this pathway, the standard sort of supervised pathway, or um, as I was saying, do something more sophisticated where you have the, the sort of springs in between where you directly uh, you know, get these, mo these interactions to, to, to uh, talk to each other. So when you say the one on the right side, the bottom of the yeah. supervised, there we don't have to use the categories label, you just use all the... Well, I mean, I mean normally, to, if you, um, uh, technically, speaking, technically speaking, if you have the, the deconv net, you, you wouldn't need labels, because you could push things up here and then reconstruct all the way back down again. So this would be like a sort of deep autoencoder, if you're familiar with this, this sort of thing. Um, so you wouldn't technically need labels, but in practice, to get good performance, I think you really want to have the labels up the top here. You know, and you've got a softmax from these guys up to the labels, and you would back propagate error from both the softmax uh, through this network as well as the error, you know, doing the reconstruction. So you'd have two terms in your loss function, basically, both a reconstruction error and a kind of classification error. Okay, sorry, I'm running slightly over. So this this is really all I wanted to talk about. So I've been two little tricks um, for sort of regularizing the standard nets, and then this sort of more a sophisticated kind of model, this deconvolutional network stuff, which, you know, is a bit more ambitious scientifically in terms of trying to, you know, really get the unsupervised models working for, you know, real world images, not just little, you know, MNIST digits or little 32 by 32 color images. And so the component model, I've gone over it somewhat briefly, but uh, effectively there's code and papers on Matt's web page where you can just, you know, um, try all this stuff out because it is a little bit complicated to implement. Okay, so I'm done.